God is good all the time. All the time, He is good. It's so wonderful to see each of your faces here today, knowing that you're children of God, this King of kings and Lord of lords. If you have not seen yet, if you want to remember the gist of the Ten Commandments, watch carefully. I will show you again. Hopefully, you are remembering. Start off with pointing one, first commandment, one God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Two, actually, it's like this don't bow, no graven images. Three, W is a shape of words, don't take his name in vain. Four, stop, rest, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Five, yes, sir, honor your father and your mother. Six, don't kill. Seven, uh, let's see. Oh, that's right, my favorite one. Seven, in a marriage there are two, not five. Seven, eight, don't steal or you'll end up in prison. Nine, I have five fingers, not four, don't bear false witness. And ten, don't covet, don't covet. All right, very easy. Who has the third commandment down? This was an easy one. I want to hear from someone, one, one of you, maybe two of you. I hope you're taking this challenge seriously. I'm concerned, maybe you're just shy. That, my guess, may be the real problem. But I hope you're taking time to put them in your minds and hearts. Ten Commandments, it seems like a lot, but I'm thinking that we better, better have them planted in our minds so that God can deepen them within our hearts and souls. Who has the third commandment down? Come on, this is an easy one. Don't be shy. I won't come over there. Even if you just want to say it where you're at, it is fine. Third commandment, that's the W, the words... Someone, I'm going to stand out here. If you want to keep here all day, I'll be happy to stand. I'm not leaving until one says the third commandment. Right? For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Thank you. You saved the day. I saw people getting a little nervous there. Memorize those commandments, especially the one we're going to focus on today. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, there's a misnomer. Oftentimes, on others who are not Adventists, they look at Adventists, they see what we talk about a lot as the Sabbath day, and they tell us, well, you put the fourth commandment above all the other commandments. Well, we do focus on that a lot more than the other commandments, but we don't put it above all the other commandments because the commandments are ten in one. They are Christ in character, and we know the final test deals with the fourth commandment the days in which we live in. So it is a focal point. But as we'll see, they are all together tied in. Today we'll see that, I think, even more clearly. Now remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, let's have a word of prayer together, and we will start as well. Pray with me, will you? Father in heaven, Lord, we give our hearts to you. What parts that we hold back, we ask you to take anyway. Lord, we want to hear the message. We want to understand the specialness of the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Lord, speak to us. Reach our hearts. Break down any stubborn walls or any pride that may be in the way that we may hear what the Spirit says. We only want to hear the Holy Spirit, Lord. Drive the enemy out. Surround us with angels that excel in strength, we pray. Empty us, Lord, that you may fill us. Full, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, the Sabbath, I've never realized, like the last week, how in-depth it is. It cannot be covered in one Sabbath. We are going to take two, and that's even pushing it. But uh, we'll start off today. You know, your, I believe your eternal life depends on your understanding the Sabbath. I believe it's huge. I believe that we are about to see the crisis break out right in front of us. But today we're going to break it down. We're going to talk about the fourth commandment, the seal of God, the specific day and time of each Sabbath, its purpose, and then next Sabbath, how do we keep it? And we'll talk about Nehemiah's Sabbath courage. And did Jesus and his disciples keep it? What about in heaven? As well as, I'll give you a handout, we'll briefly touch on the arguments against the Sabbath day being on the seventh day of the week, Saturday. We will address those next week, so you don't want to miss. 
Ten Commandments, as you, if you have been traveling this journey with us, you realize already that it is indeed not about a list of rules and laws. It is about Jesus Christ. It is all about Jesus. When we understand how it ties in and He is our focal point, we gain so much more in our relationship with Jesus. It is simply beautiful. I want to share with you before we continue on the Sabbath from last week, don't take God's name in vain. A couple of avenues, just real quick, two scripture, Matthew 6, 7. When you pray, this is an important one. We have got to have a reverence, hopefully we will have a reverence for God's name even, that we don't try to get creative when we're praying, especially in public. You know, to sound and tie in a number of different part of his names and bring them in together to try to, you know, make it sound more worthy, we've got to protect his name. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Now, if, you were, if you've read the story of Elijah and Mount Carmel and the Baal worshippers, what were they doing around the altar for hours and hours and hours? Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. They were just crying out and and vain repetition, of course, being an an idol. We know that he wasn't going to hear because Baal is not alive. That is the work of the enemy. We have got to be careful that we in our Christian prayers do not allow ourselves to keep using God's name over and over and over and over throughout the prayer. Protect that holy name. Hugely important. Hugely important. And our next verse, uh, Matthew 5, actually a couple of verses, 33 to 37. Again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all. Is that not a good piece of advice? Now, we're not talking about the cursing and swearing part. We're talking about, you know, saying, I swear to you know who. I swear that, you know, this is the truth. I swear that, you know, we have to be careful. We lose our reverence, our respect for Him. It is better. In fact, notice the last part of the verse here down below. But let your yes be yes and your no, no, for whatever is more than this is from the evil one. If you make a vow to God, like, Lord, I'm promising you this. How many times? Ananias and Sapphira, they promised they were going to sell this piece of land, remember? And they thought that God could be trifled with. They kept part of the money for themselves. My friends... We'll talk about this again, but I hope we're not doing this with the tithing from God. Figuring we can put it wherever we want to put it. Not trusting Him that He is capable of handling everything within the realm of. Let's be careful with our words, and it's best to not promise something we may not be able to keep. All right, one final quotation, then we'll move on into our Sabbath. According to the teaching of the Scriptures, Spirit of Prophecy writes... It dishonors God to address ministers as reverend. Now, I'm not faulting or judging anyone out there that goes with the title reverend. But the point is that in the Bible, in the Scriptures, there is only one who is reverend. Reverend definition is holy, is righteous. I, as a pastor, may represent Jesus, but let me tell you what, I fail in comparison and never do I want someone to call me reverend. All right, God alone. Let's read on the quotation now. No mortal has any right to attach this to his own name or the name of any other human being. It belongs only to God to distinguish him from every other being. Here's the scriptures. Holy and reverend is his name. Not my name. Not anyone else's name, but it's his name. We dishonor God when we use this word where it does not belong. The Father and the Son alone are to be exalted, friends. So hopefully you can take those points and pray over them, and let's give God the reverence that He deserves, and we need to become less. You remember John's, John the Baptist, his joy was found when he became less and disappeared in prison, and Jesus became greater. That's the whole gospel message, friends. Well, a man one day, an illustration story, one man challenged another man to an uh, all-day wood chopping contest. Wouldn't that be fun? Anyone like to join, join me in a contest like that? Oh, I love chopping wood, actually. It's a great workout. 
All right, yep, yeah, you've experienced that. So this, these challenge, the challenger, he worked very hard. He stopped only briefly for a quick lunch break, and then, then he went right back, and he was just pounding wood, and he thought, well, I've got this guy, because when he, when he looked over there in between his hits, he realized that this guy was taking many breaks. He was at his leisure. He took a leisure lunch, and when they finished the end of the day, lo and behold, the challenger looked in disbelief, and the woodpile of the one who had taken the leisure breaks and the leisure lunch had more wood cut than he had. I don't understand. I don't get it. How, how did this happen? I saw you. You were just taking breaks, and I was just pounding away and cutting wood. And well, the other, the other man looked at him, and he said, well, my friend, he said, what you didn't probably realize was that every time... You were, I was taking a rest. I was also sharpening my axe. What a wonderful illustration of God's plan for the Sabbath rest. God, His intent is to sharpen our relationship with Jesus. When you think about the Sabbath, you think about six days, you know, you work and you labor, and it's God's plan that the seventh day we lay aside our burdens, we lay aside our work, we lay aside everything that stresses us out as much as possible, we come to Him. Do you realize, my friends, that the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week, is a taste of heaven on earth? Think about that for a moment. Every Sabbath, every seven days we get to come into the presence of Jesus. We get to worship Him who created us. We get to focus on Jesus and Jesus alone. You know the commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Say it with me if you know it. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The longest commandment in the Bible of all ten. A coincidence? I think not. The longest commandment, not that length is, is, is of importance really in God's sight, but there is a something special in the fourth commandment that you and I, we cannot forget. I want to point out one thing. You know that portion where it says, six days you shall labor and do all your work? What's that next two words? But, what's the next word? It's underlined, the. What is that called? Many of you know, the definite article. In the original language in Hebrew, it is pointing to a specific day of rest. I've heard many argue, they come, they share, well, you know, as long as you take one day of rest. Others have other arguments, we'll look at those next week. My friends, Jesus didn't just give us any day to take a rest. Jesus said six days you labor, but the seventh day, meaning a definite day, I want you to rest. Come and spend time with me. Come and be a definite article. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Notice the words in Psalm 77, verse 11. I will remember thy works of the Lord, or the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. What is he doing here in these writings? He is pointing back to another time, right? Why does God start off the fourth commandment with the word remember? Remember. You've heard me, those who have been in evangelistic series, talked about the Sabbath with someone else. Remember means that you were told before. Honey, take out the trash this morning. Remember to take out the trash this morning. She told him last night, right? Remember, it happened before, without any doubt. So when was the Sabbath originally given? Let's go back to two different time periods, which prove it was given before. We begin with Exodus chapter 5 verse 4 and 5. Now, I want you to notice something about this. This is Israel. They're slaves in Egypt. God is calling them out to head what direction? Toward the promised land. All right? Notice before he begins deliverance, he calls them back to the Sabbath day rest. They've been slaves for years, working seven days a week. Deliverance is around the corner, my friends. And notice the words in Exodus chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. Then the king of Egypt said to them, 
Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from your labor. All right, interesting. God came in through Moses, and Aaron, his brother, joined him. He said, look, we have got to get back and remember our Creator. He has given us this day of rest, and even though we're in slavery here in bondage, God has given the command that we should remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Let's begin to rest like we should of all this time. Oh, my friends, is it possible Jesus has not come yet because this Sabbath rest is something that even many of us Seventh-day Adventists have lost sight of? We're not really resting and laying aside everything else that is a burden and stressful and Oh, my friends, you know when sin came in? When sin came into this world, God's plan was simply to create in us a holy heart, a clean heart, to give us a relationship, to get us back to the way it was supposed to be. I like the words in Exodus 16. This points it out. They were given the the manna raining down from heaven. Verse 22, and so it was on the sixth day, Moses is explaining the message from God that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses, hey, they're gathering double. Didn't you say only one helping per day? So Moses goes on to explain. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Gather double. Food will keep. Any other day, it'll rot if you try to store it. Sabbath, rest, before they enter into the promised land. Continuing on, verse 23, bake what you will bake today, that's the preparation day, boil what you will boil, lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning, so they laid it up till morning, as Moses commanded, it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Continuing on, verse 25, then Moses said, eat that today. For today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. I want you to notice the next verse 26. There's something really important in this. Verse 26 says, Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. This is a power verse for Sabbath keeping. I've never realized it before, but notice what it says. It talks about the Sabbath. That's a definite article, and there are almost none, maybe no others in Scripture. Maybe there's one or two. I don't know. But it's a definite article, the Sabbath, and it's directly tying into the seventh day in one verse. The Sabbath. There's only one Sabbath, and it is on the seventh day of the week. Oh, my friends, the Sabbath goes back even further Many of us know Genesis 2, 1 to 3, this is where it first happened, it originated. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished, and on the seventh day God ended His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work which God had created and made. What do you notice about those, those, those words in blue there? Is God trying to make a point or is He trying to make a point? You know, I've said it before and you know, when God says something once, it's important. When He says it twice, it's really important. When He says it's three, it's eternally important. The seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. Why is God just emphasizing the seventh day? Is it possible why He started the commandment with remember, not only because He gave it before, but because most of Christianity would forget the Sabbath day? which is on the seventh day. Absolutely certain that is the case. Matthew 16, verse 26. I think about this, my friends. You know, those who give the, those who give the uh, you know, kind of the reasoning, they come up with, um, they come up with, in fact, I remember this in a story form, actually. I shared it back a number of years. I remember a gentleman, I'd just done a two-part series on the Sabbath. And I'll never forget, one of my members, my elders, he said, let me take a couple of copies, and I've got a pastor friend of mine preaching on this in the Sunday-keeping church, and I'll take it to him. Surely he can see that this is biblical. So he took it to him. He talked to him a couple of weeks later, and he said, well, so what do you think, John? And John said, well, you know, your pastor's right. You know, the right day, the right Sabbath is on the seventh day of the week. That is Saturday. 
But then what he said next just floored my friend and it floored me. He said, you know, but, but Paul, he said, I, I could never, you know, start keeping the Sabbath day in my church because I would lose my ministry. I would lose my career. And so he went on his way. I hope and pray and have prayed for years that I hope those seeds planted will somehow water. The Holy Spirit will take those and will wake him up before it's too late. And I think, and that's why I come to this next scripture in Matthew 16, 26, for what profit is it to a man, woman, it doesn't matter, if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Would you keep a a career? Would you keep a reputation that you're looked at and noticed by everyone around you in your life? Would you choose that over being faithful to our Creator? Yet many of us are faced with that choice, that decision, some not so obvious, some not so obvious. We know we have a number here, a couple of that have gone through this, this situation where they're wanting to keep the Sabbath day holy. They're just not sure because they have to work and feed their families. What a challenge it is. Is all I'll say for right now, my friends, is God is faithful. He will not let your bread be empty from your table. He will make sure everything is taken care of if you are faithful to Him. What about the time period of the 24 hours? Leviticus 23, verse 32, gives us some light. It says, from evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Well, if you're unfamiliar with Seventh-day Adventists, you know that we stand according to what the Scriptures tell us, and that is that Sabbath begins the sunset before to sunset after the next day. So Friday night, last night, about, what is it, 6.30 right now or so, um, that begins the Sabbath rest, kind of entering in the Sabbath hours. Now, why is this? Let's go pull some more puzzle pieces into this picture. Genesis chapter 1. Have you ever wondered why, in verses 3 to 5, this is one example of five total, Um, actually five others, there's there's six total. Then God said, first day, He said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. Here's the sentence that when I was young, I asked myself many times, now why would He word it like this? Here's what it says, so the evening and the morning were the first day. These are in order for a tremendous purpose. God put them like that. This is not some misunderstanding from the English language, from the Hebrew original. This is the way God worded it. One comes before the other when the sun goes down. Every day he created the same thing. Evening and the morning were the second day. Evening and the morning were the third day. Evening and the morning were the fourth day and onward. We look at Genesis 1, verse 14, we get a pretty strong indication of the Sabbath is on the same day, same seventh day of the week, the Sabbath in the weekly cycle. Verse 14 says, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens, as he's getting ready to create sun, moon, and stars, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons for days and years. Now you hear the arguments, we'll talk about some of those next week, but you know that we don't know what day it is. Have you ever heard that? We're not sure because time, you know, we we may have lost track of which day is really the Sabbath day. Isn't it, I find it ironic that the same individuals will say, well, we don't know the day, you know, so they'll keep worshiping on Sunday or another day. But when it comes to, well, when did Jesus rise from the dead? Oh, we know that. That was on the first day of the week. That's why people in the world celebrate Easter Sunday. No doubt about that. We never hear anyone arguing about that he rose on the first day of the week. But yet when it comes to the day before, the day that Jesus rested in his death, oh, we don't know which day the Sabbath is. Isn't that a little confusing to you? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, my friends. Weekly cycle has always been the same. The Sabbath has always been the seventh day of the week. It has never changed. We go to Mark chapter 15. Here's a couple of more verses that help us understand what I was just telling you. Now, when evening had come, verse 42, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. Jesus died on the cross. Friday as we know it today. Preparation day. 
the day before the Sabbath. We go to Mark 16, parts of verse 1 through 6. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Of course, she's talking to an angel. Now they looked in when they came that Sunday morning really early. It was already empty. Jesus had already resurrected. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. First day of the week. We know without a doubt the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week, my friends, right from scriptures itself. Did you realize how many languages have Sabbath for the name of the seventh day of the week? How many languages? All right, some of you who have other languages, help me out. What's the, what's the word for Sabbath or for Saturday? Sa- Sandra? Sabado. All right, there's one. We're looking at the word for Saturday. is not Saturday like in English, but it is the word Sabbath. What else? Is that Hindi? B-B-A-T. Okay, Shabbat. All right, good. What else? Some of you come from have different culture backgrounds. Okay, what is it? All right, Portuguese, it's the Sabbath word. What else? All right, Sabota. And there's others as well, all right? Okay. All right, the seventh day word that has been around for years and years and years has often, for it's over 140 languages, the word for Saturday, the seventh day of the week, is Sabbath in so many languages. Why is that, my friends? We have never lost sight of the Sabbath. It has always been, and it always will be. Sabado, Sobota, Sabado, again, Sabaton. It goes on and on and on. I want to change gears now. What about this seal of the living God, my friends? The Sabbath commandment is hugely important because it has the seal of God right in the heart of the commandments. We go to Revelation 7, verses 2 to 4. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard a number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. This is symbolic. Revelation, much of it is symbolic. These are all God's people. The 144,000 are those left alive that have not seen death when Jesus comes. Of course, there will be a whole massive slew of people that have gone to the grave that will be resurrected to join them in the end. I find it kind of fascinating here when you look at this, do not harm the earth, the sea, the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God, of our God on their foreheads. It's, it's fascinating to me. It's like we're hearing, do not hurt creation until we have sealed our children with a mark of their creator. Isn't it kind of fascinating when you look at that verse like that? Where's the seal of God? Right in the heart of the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. You see the seal, everyone's seal contains the name, the title, and the domain. The name, the title, and the domain, God's seal is found in the heart of the fourth commandment. He is the Lord our God. He is creator. He made everything around us. And of course we know his domain is everywhere in this earth in the heavens above. I love the words found in Revelation 4.11, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. It points directly to our Creator God, doesn't it? Psalms 33 verse 9, I try to wrap my mind around this all this past week. Every time I read this verse, I cannot begin to wrap my mind around this. How can someone, a being in this universe, speak and a world is created? To realize how powerful and awesome this God is that we serve. 
He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. I can try it right now to create. Let there be light. Nothing happens. He must be some God to be able to call a, a world into existence. Not only the world, but a whole universe. He's amazing. Notice the words found in our three angels' messages, my friends. Don't miss this point. These are the last three most powerful messages that go out to the world. This is what the Seventh-day Adventist Church should be, hopefully is, all about. The gospel message. Verse 7, the angel is saying with what kind of voice? He's saying with a what? A loud voice that's very indicative of a a very important message he does not want us to forget. Fear God and give glory to Him. We'll come back to that one next week. Give glory to Him, or actually a little bit later, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. Some of that wording, where does that, what does that sound familiar from somewhere else in the Bible? goes right back to the fourth commandment. One of the final messages with a loud voice that God is saying is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Get back to your creator. Why do we think we hear so much on evolution all the time in the media? We hear the wisdom, and I use the term loosely, of these scholars and these philosophers who give answers. They call them out. They pay them a lot of, you know, a lot of money in order to come out and pass their wisdom to everyone else about how they think things transpired in the beginning. How about evolution? They begin, you know, man's, what is it? Man's wisdom is what to God? Foolishness. Sometimes you sit and you listen, you just shake your head, you just want to reach through the, through the, through the screen and just... Shake them up. So are you serious? There's a real God in heaven who really spoke things into existence. Give glory to Him. Notice in Paul's writings, he, or excuse me, oh, go to Ecclesiastes first, then we'll go to Paul's. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. Before the difficult days come, friends. The seal of God has more than just the Sabbath keeping of the fourth commandment. I don't want you to miss this point. I said something earlier before when I was down on the floor. The seal of God has more than just keeping the Sabbath day holy. It has to do with all ten of the commandments, even though the fourth is a focal point in our modern day. What is the purpose of the Sabbath? Going changing gears again. Looking at its bare minimum, you know, as we've we've gone through the commandments, we've looked at the bare minimum requirement of the law and then the maximum fulfillment. All right. Well, the minimum, we know, is just don't work. Other than taking care of our sick and doing, you know, the duties of the medical field and, you know, oftentimes those protecting us, we understand, if at all possible, lay work aside. Don't work, the minimum requirement. If that's all there is to the Sabbath, my friends, you'll soon walk away from the Sabbath because there is so much more. 2 Timothy 2.19, fascinating, powerful word. Don't miss this point. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Wow. The Lord knows those who are His, who are sealed, my friends. It's those that have embraced Jesus in a forever relationship, everlasting, that have loved Him so much that they have, through His power alone, through the Holy Spirit, they have turned their back on continuing purposefully to live a life of sin and iniquity. The seal of God He is wanting to put upon your forehead today. He is wanting to put it on my forehead, in our hearts, for it to embrace every aspect of it, of us. How do we give glory to God? The seal of God, my friends, the Sabbath is getting back to the Creator, remembering that He is our Redeemer. He is the one that can save us from our past sins and change us so that we live a life without sin. I'm not saying we're perfect or ever will be until Jesus comes. I'm making no such claims. To be perfect, biblically speaking, be therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, is to be so mature in your understanding of your relationship with Jesus that you surrender all. You say, Jesus, come in and take over the reins of my life. 
I must decrease, you must be lifted up. That's perfection, my friends. The seal of God is connected with us who take the name Christian and depart from all iniquity. I repeat it. Hypocrisy, my friends, needs to go out of all of us. God is not looking for people professing to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For those professing to have a relationship with God, those who wear the name but want to stubbornly hang on to and cling on to things of this world, he is looking for people not to be hypocrites like we often have been. I am guilty as well as anyone else. He wants us to be his holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Hypocrisy needs to go. If you want to be God, you have to be all of God's. A little leaven will destroy and ruin the whole lump of dough, friends. It only takes a little tiny bit of sin. Only a tiny bit. If you don't want all of Christ, then you are none of his friends. This is biblical. It's not my philosophy. Go if you must, but we must stop pretending for we are hurting him and the gospel, friends. It's his desire that all would come and be saved, that all would embrace him entirely as Lord and Savior, to remember the Creator. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. His, his bar of righteousness is not our level where we're at. It's God's level. It's a daily walk, a daily surrender to Jesus Christ. It's waking up those early morning hours that Ron was trying to encourage. It's asking God, if you have a hard time waking up, God, wake me up. I want to spend time with you. I need to have time with you. My friends, if we don't have time with Jesus on a daily basis, we're going to be lost. Not because we have to. Pastor Kurt is not trying to say, you know what, you're you know, pointing fingers and doing whatever and saying, you know, you have to anything. The point is, we, we take breaths of air all the time, don't we? If we didn't breathe, we wouldn't be alive. There is a tremendous parallel with breathing Jesus every day. If we don't breathe Jesus in a relationship daily, we'll not be alive in the end. We will lose out with this forever relationship with Christ. You see, friends, Sabbath is a time for us to rest from the burden of sin. Anybody burdened here with sin like I am? Are you burdened with it? If you aren't, then you're living on some other planet. If the devil's leaving you alone, then you're in trouble. Period. If they persecuted him, they'll persecute those who are followers of him. Be of good cheer, Jesus said, I've overcome the world when tribulations come your way. The Sabbath is to bring you and I into a sanctification of Christ-likeness. That's its intent. It's a taste of heaven. Ezekiel 20, verse 12, moreover, the Bible tells us, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign, another word for seal, they're interchangeable, to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. There's that departing from iniquity. Oh, my friends. Take your Bible real quick. Go to Exodus 31 with me. Exodus chapter 31 will begin in verse 12. Just before the golden calf experience. Well, we don't often go to these verses, but wow, God goes into in depth on the Sabbath rest. Exodus 31, beginning with verse 12. Reading out of Old King James, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. 
You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doth any work on therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in that Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. You know what that word perpetual means? It means literally ever continuing, always continuing forward. This is not something that deals with the feast days or the sanctuary symbolic services. This is the Sabbath will be forever. Finishing up, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. I love that about God. He was refreshed, not because he was tired, just reflecting on the gift of the world and the creation that he gave to you and me. Beautiful. He gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two ta tables, tablets of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So we know exactly what Sabbath he's talking about here, the fourth commandment. Revelation 14, verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Notice here again, his purpose for the Sabbath rest is take us away from that burden of sin, that life of sin. Notice the next words, and in their mouth was found how much deceit? No deceit. No hypocrisy. Just living the life transparent as a, G a lover of Jesus, a Jesus follower. For they are without fault before the throne of God because God is able to look at his people. When you take Jesus, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see us. I praise God for that trade-off because without it, we'd be in a lot of trouble, wouldn't we? You've heard the song, Come Away? You remember the Come Away song? Beautiful words. I want to share the lyrics. To me, they're a wonderful example of the purpose of God's Sabbath rest day. Don't you be in such a hurry. Because it only leads to worry. There's a time to work, and there's a time to play. Is that supposed to be pray? Try and cast your cares on Him. He'll give you perfect peace within. Can't you hear the Spirit calling? Come away. Come away. Come away. Come and spend some time with me. Come away. Let your heart and mind be filled. Let your empty cup be filled. Can't you hear the Spirit calling? Come away. Beautiful example. Jesus, every Sabbath, He is calling for us. Come away. Come away. He's not calling on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. He's with us in a relationship, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But a special day, my friends, Jesus has set up where you hear his voice with love and passion and compassion saying, come away. I see your burdens. I see, I know your carry. I know the struggles that you have every single day and night. Come away. Come and be with me. You feel like your cup is empty? I'll fill it. You feel like you're alone and you have to bear the life's burdens all by yourself? Come away. I'm always with you all the way to the end of the world. I believe Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, familiar words, goes right along the same lines. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come away. Struggling marriage? Come away. Worry about your children? Come away. Not sure if you're going to put another meal on your table for your family? Come away. I got your back. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. 
Wouldn't it be kind of silly for us to turn away and say, no, I'm going to keep, keep my heavy burden? That'd be just downright ridiculous, wouldn't it? Come away. Let me give you a taste of heaven. Here's a gentle FYI. When you think about the Sabbath, friends, playing a game of football on Sabbath or basketball gives us good blood flow. It burns calories. You get time with family and friends. But it doesn't give us Christ's blood covering. It doesn't endear us to Him. It doesn't bring redemption and sanctification. God created a special blessing we can only find on the true Sabbath day when we enter into His rest. Everything else that deals with self, with us, if He's not front and center in the foundation, then come away. Come away. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus made the day for us so we could come and rest and be blessed so we could be changed into His likeness so we can be prepared for heaven. Come away. Listen to the words found in the testimony of Jesus through Ellen White's writings. He rescued them from their servile state, talking about Israel out of Egypt, that He might bring them to a good land a land which in His providence had been prepared for them as a refuge from their enemies. Are you hearing the message, church? We all have enemies. If we're trying to follow Christ, we have enemies that are dogging our steps every single day and night. They are Satan, evil angels. Sometimes Satan has his servants in people who also dog our steps. Oh, my friends, He wants to be a refuge from our enemies where they might dwell under the shadow of His wings. He would bring them to Himself and encircle them in His everlasting arms. And in return for all His goodness and mercy to them, they were required to have no other gods before Him, the living God, and to exalt His name and make it glorious in the earth. I'm thinking that's a pretty easy trade-off. Give him my all, my, my struggles, my stress, my idols, the things I'm hanging on to. If he has loved me this much, then he is worth every single one of those. To lay down at the altar. Go to Jesus. I was driving last, last Sabbath, was it? I think it was last Sabbath afternoon. Was that two Sabbaths ago? No, it was last Sabbath. To fight, you know, the fellowship and God's healing touch. The meetings we're having once a month. I was on 75, and as I'm driving along, and I'm kind of a little bit in a rush trying to get there, and go on the speed limit, though. And I'm driving, and up ahead, a little ways on one of those walkover bridges, you can see there's a bunch of people up there, and, and so holding up some banners and everything, and wasn't sure what it was. I got a little closer, a little closer, and as I'm driving, and I look up, and I see, you know, honk, you know, signs, honk if you, whatever, and, and I saw honk and love, and so I started laying on the horn, and I honked all the way until I got right up underneath the bridge. And I looked up, and it was the LGBT movement. So then I floored it, hoping nobody would see my license plate. I share this story with you to make the final point before we close. You know, a Christian can be sincere... They can have good motives. They can want to do the right thing. My friends, we can be as sincere as we want, but when it comes to the fourth commandment, it takes more than sincerity and good motives and our perception to be entirely faithful to Jesus and remember the real Sabbath day to keep it holy. I can be sincere all the way to the end and saying Jesus loves me and he'll understand if I continue worshiping on another day. 
other than the day he said over and over, the seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day, the Sabbath. I can be sincere all the way to the end and say Jesus will understand. And when judgment day comes, we will look at Jesus in the face and his eyes and we will see him turn away and say, and I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. To reject the seventh-day Sabbath, friends, is to sin against God. When you know the truth, when you hear the truth about the real day, to keep another day is, to me, in all honesty, once you know the truth, is like spitting in his face. You might as well be holding the lash in your hand and beating him on the back. Jesus has given us a special time period to come and be with him. There is no substitute. It's the truth that will set you free. The truth will set you free. Think of all the blessings we would miss out on if we didn't remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the seventh day of the week. Your eternity is at stake. So is mine. It's a narrow way that leads through Jesus to eternal life, few there will be that find it. I encourage you to not delay, not for a moment. Not for a moment, friends. Stand on the truth. Get with the Creator because He has a wonderful, wonderful, redeeming package He has waiting just for you so we can stand in the presence of Jesus one day with no veil between. I'm kind of excited about that. I got goosebumps as I just, just said that. Does that excite you? Do you want that to be your outcome in the end? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As we close with prayer, if it's your desire, whether you've been keeping the Sabbath and maybe you've been keeping it, come back next week because I'm going to talk more in depth about how to keep the Sabbath day holy. It's hard. I don't have all the answers. I admit well, we'll see what the Holy Spirit brings us. Your desire to keep the Sabbath day holy, the real seventh day of the week, stand with me as we, as we close with prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, it is with grateful hearts. We know you love us. Lord, biblically speaking, we know that the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. We know that you are calling us. You are meeting with us on that day. It is a day to rejoice, a day to find a specialness. You, you made this Sabbath for man, all of us, mankind. Thank you for giving us this gift. Lord, instead of being bothered that the Sabbath hours are beginning Friday night, help us to be excited the closer it gets. It's kind of like, you know, when... When I was a little boy, and my mom would tell me, Grandpa and Grandma are coming over tonight. Lord, I would, an hour, two hours ahead of time, I would just go and stare out the window, just waiting for that car to turn into the driveway, and I could run out to the house and shout to everybody, hey, they're here, they're here. Lord, give us that kind of relationship with Jesus, that we can be looking out that window, Lord, in our lives. And we can say, he's here, he's here. As that sun goes down, and we will rejoice and be just with Jesus in his presence. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.